I started talking to this girl years back named Christina. We met through mutual friends, and after a while of commenting on each other's Snapchat stories, I decided to just bite the bullet and ask her out on a date. It was mid-July, so options for things to do were abundant. Namely, the beach and anything outdoors was an option for a first date. There's a beach by me that allows trucks to drive onto it with proper permits, and I frequently go there still to this day with my pickup truck. It was a night that neither of us had work the next day, so we decided to go to the beach and have a little bonfire with some drinks. On a weeknight past 8 o'clock, I knew next to nobody else would be on the beach that late, so it was what seemed like a perfect first date in privacy. She lived only 5 minutes away from me, so I picked her up and then we stopped at a 7-Eleven where I bought some firewood and other supplies for the fire. Then we headed straight to the beach. To be honest, I'd never started a fire before that, so I was scared of embarrassing myself. But on paper, it sounded like a good idea. I pulled us onto the trail that leads to the beach. It's a decently long trail, and at one point there's a fork in the path, where 99% of people turn right to the main beach. But I often go left, because it's a lesser known, smaller but more private section of beach. We went left, and when we got to the beach section, we were the only people there. I had my brights on, and could see basically all the way down the empty beach. Not another truck in sight. I pulled my truck up on a sand hill, then parked it, and we started to unload the truck. I dug a hole with my shovel to place the firewood and some smaller fire catching sticks, and honestly, I couldn't get a fire to catch. I tried for 20 minutes and couldn't do it, and I called it quits. It was embarrassing, but we laughed about it, so we just chilled in the dark for a little bit, drinking the beers we brought. For a while, all we heard was the waves hitting the beach, but Christina was the first to point out that she heard something else in a whisper. I started to listen closer, shifting all my attention to that, and I heard what she meant. It was this whistling sound, not like a bird, it was a person for sure. Christina and I looked at each other with telling faces of how freaked out we were. The whistling was extremely close. Since we had no other light, I went into my truck and turned on the headlights, and I heard Christina scream. We both saw the back of a man's head hurrying out of the tall beach grass on the little hill of sand above my truck. He had likely been there the whole time, watching us for some reason. I yelled to get lost to the creep. I went up the little hill and tried to follow him, but right away I lost sight of him. There was tall beach grass everywhere, he could have been hiding in any of it. I took out my phone to use its flashlight and got on my toes to get a look over the grass. Looking back, I don't even think I wanted to find him, so I don't know why I didn't just get in the car right away and leave. Christina called me back to just get in the car and leave. Then I heard the whistle again. It sounded way too close for comfort, like within 10 feet from me. Christina heard it too, and she once again begged me to come back to the car. I did. I went back down the little hill and started packing the chairs and bags into the bed of my truck. As I was getting into the truck, I stopped and heard a humming from the same spot. It was clear by this point someone was deliberately trying to scare us. We got in the car and I switched my lights off and turned the engine on. I sat there for a few moments, waiting, as if I knew that whoever was in the grass would come look at us after hearing the engine start and lights turn off. And I was right. I turned my lights back on, and for just a brief moment, a man's face could be seen looking through the grass into my truck. The light being turned back on made him hide back in the grass. I was tempted to get out and beat the guy up, but Christina stopped me and convinced me that he may be sick in the head or armed, or both, and that we should just leave. I agreed, and we left the beach the whole time looking behind us to make sure we weren't being followed. It was an incredibly tense and scary drive off that beach. With the amount of crazy people out there, I have no idea what that man's intentions were, but nothing about that entire encounter was normal at all. When I was younger, my family rented a beach house for a weekend one summer. The house rental was cut extremely short, and this is why. It was our first day there. We went to the beach and then went out to eat for dinner. The sand dunes were very hilly near the house, and that night, my brother Joey and I came up with the idea of sand sledding down the hills. We found a couple big cardboard boxes in one of the closets in the house, so we cut pieces off the boxes to use as sleds. Our parents didn't mind us going out in the dark as long as we wouldn't stray too far away from the house. We found what seemed to be the tallest part of the sand hill, and started riding down the pieces of cardboard box as if they were sleds. It worked pretty well, actually. When Joey made it to the bottom, I'd say his third or fourth time, he called up to me, Tyler, what is that? I didn't see what he meant, 
So I slid down the hill again and looked at what he was pointing at. It was something in the ocean. It was this black object sticking out from the water. The moon's reflection on the ocean was just enough to see this object, but not know what it is. It looked like something was definitely floating in the water though. We were a little freaked out and were too scared to go closer and look at what it was. So we walked a little further down the beach to look for a different hill. We found one that wasn't as tall, but it was still near enough to the house. My brother slid down the hill first. I stood at the top watching. I looked out to the ocean again, and I saw that black object in the water again. It's as if we didn't even move, or as if it followed us. I yelled at Joey to look at the ocean again. He looked and probably saw it right away, because he ran up the hill to me freaked out. We were discussing what we thought the thing could be. Maybe we didn't move as much as we thought we did. We stared at the object for a while, and we could see it was bopping around a bit. We looked down the beach at the house we were staying at. It wasn't too far away, so we decided to get a closer look at this floating object. We thought maybe it was a dead animal floating in the water. We couldn't have been more wrong. As we got maybe halfway to the water, the black object floating around bopping in the water started to rise, and we realized it wasn't floating at all. A person's body was revealed as they stood up at a towering height, arms now flat at their sides. It was a person's head this whole time. We ran to the house and slammed the door behind us, yelling to our parents. Our parents seemed confident that there was no threat from someone going for a night swim though, even after we said they were following us in the water. Our dad went out to the backyard deck with the lights on and looked around the beach, and when he didn't see anyone, he told us we had nothing to worry about. It wasn't until later that night that we heard our mom scream from the living room as Joey and I were in the room we were sharing. We jumped out of our beds to rush outside and see what it was. As we entered the living room, our dad yelled at us to go back to our room, but we didn't listen right away. They were looking at something outside. We walked over to see what it was they were staring at. Close enough to see him, a naked smiling man on the backyard deck, waving. My dad then physically moved us back into our bedroom and told us not to come out. We heard everything as our dad was screaming threats of calling the police at the man. Then there was a loud bang from the glass of the back door accompanied with the sound of our mom screaming. Our dad yelled at our mom to go stay with the kids. She came into the room and tried to comfort us while we heard our dad calling 911, all while hearing periodic bangs on the glass. Our dad is not a big guy and he's far from a fighter, so the chances of him going outside to confront that man himself were slim to none unless it was absolutely necessary. This went on for a few minutes before the bang stopped and our dad seemed calmer. A bunch of police cars came to the house. There were more police officers in the house than I can remember counting. My brother and I were asked to describe what we saw on the beach to help tie the whole story together. Our parents to this day tell us that the most likely explanation was a child predator on drugs. It was a very sick and disturbing thing for our entire family to go through. In fact, 12 years later, it's still cringy and disturbing to think back on. And yes, the obvious answer to the obvious question, did we leave after that encounter? Yes, we did. And our parents got their money back. We ended up staying at a nearby resort so as not to waste the weekend. But obviously, we were all a bit shaken up after that. When I was 20, my girlfriend Stevie and I wanted to go to this local beach fireworks show for the 4th of July. However, all the main beach parking lots were completely full, and it was absolute chaos trying to find parking. Eventually, we ended up driving further down the road to a less crowded, almost empty parking lot. People were parked in the lot sitting on beach chairs in the parking lot, apparently ready to watch the show from there, but Stevie and I didn't want to do that. We walked onto the beach with our blanket and drinks. We had to cross a tunnel under the overpass to get to the beach side away from the parking lot. The beach was surprisingly empty. Apparently, we were the only ones who thought it'd be a good idea to walk to the main beach. We started our long walk. We walked for literally 20 minutes until the fireworks started shooting into the air. We weren't that close, but it was better than nothing, and we were tired from walking. We had the beach to ourselves where we laid down the blanket. We were literally just making the best of the situation. The fireworks show was decently long. About 10 minutes into the show, I heard voices from behind us. I turned around and saw a few people in the distance. They were standing facing the fireworks. Nothing strange there, probably just more people watching the fireworks show. We sat for another 10 minutes or so, around the time the show ended. We were being eaten alive by mosquitoes by that point, so we picked all our stuff up and started speed walking back. 
We passed a few tunnels, and although they all looked the same, we remembered that the one we crossed had two garbage cans right next to the left wall. I could see a young man approaching us from the darkness ahead. He greeted us and asked us for help. I slowed my walk, but didn't come to a complete halt, because I was instantly wary of this guy. He looked to be one of the guys I had seen in the distance earlier. He was pointing into the tunnel next to him, saying his friend was injured and he needed help, but that he didn't have a phone on him. Stevie seemed equally sketched out as me. I continued to inch away from the guy while holding her, gauging this young Hispanic man who appeared to be in his mid-twenties. I asked him where his friend was, and he said in the parking lot beyond the tunnel. I looked into the tunnel, which was completely pitch black. There was no way in hell I was going through there. This seemed incredibly off. I apologized and said we're in a hurry, and pulled Stevie along with me as we continued to walk quickly away. The man's tone changed to more annoyed, angry. He called me a piece of shit as we walked away. I didn't even turn around to acknowledge. I just whispered to Stevie to keep walking. I'd look over my shoulder every few seconds, checking if we were being followed by him, and eventually I realized we were. He, along with two other people, were tailing us from not far behind, already indicating that the man lied about his so-called injured friend. We were about to be jumped, I could feel it. I told Stevie to run ahead to the tunnel with the two garbage cans. I knew if we both ran that it would probably trigger the group of men behind us to chase us. She moved ahead in a low-key, non-obvious jog. I realized the men behind me were getting closer. I wanted to give Stevie a little more time to get ahead to the car before I would book it. By the time I'd made it to the tunnel, I turned around again, and the three men were almost right on top of me now. One of them started shouting, hey, come here. Stevie was trying to call me, but I couldn't pick up. As soon as I got to the entrance of the tunnel, I felt that they were about to run up to me and grab me, so I booked it through the tunnel, and I heard their footsteps right behind me. I sprinted on the concrete wall barefoot, but I endured the pain in the heat of the moment, in fear for my life. I made it through the tunnel to the parking lot, which was lit up by streetlights, thank God, and somewhere in the tunnel, the three men stopped chasing me. The parking lot was now empty besides two other cars, and my car, which Stevie was already in with the lights on. I ran to get in the car, and I looked back one final time to the tunnel, and saw two of the three guys standing probably ten feet into the tunnel, watching. I got in the car, and we drove out of the parking lot and down the parkway, and honestly, I was never so relieved to see the taillights of a traffic jam from the thousands of people leaving the main beach parking lots. I have no clue if we were going to be mugged or murdered, but clearly those people were there that night with a plan. I'm glad we didn't fall for their trap.